Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Monster of the Week. Today, we're taking a trip down memory lane and talking about a creature I first discovered back in 2015. And oh boy did I suck at making videos in 2015. This week's monster was the subject of the fourth video I ever made about D&D monsters on this channel, and to this day they've remained one of my personal favorites. So, much like I did with the Kythons from the Book of Vile Darkness, today I'm going to be revisiting the Chrono Tyran. We're going to be setting out on a journey to the eternal battlefields of Asheron where this creature got its start. Then I'm going to go over the story of the Chrono Tyran themselves, what they want, what they can do, and how they might achieve those goals. And ultimately, I'm going to go over my 5th edition conversion of this monster from D&D 3rd edition, what I've changed, what I've kept, and why this monstrosity is truly one of my favorite creatures to ever end up in the pages of any monster book. But first I need to put my hair up, it's like a million degrees in here, what the fuck? Temperatures above 15 degrees were a mistake. So if you're ready to embark on this expedition with me, I am more than prepared to share with you the tale of the Chrono Tyran. One of the last 3rd edition books to ever be published before the game jumped to D&D 3.5 was the Fiend Folio. Not that Fiend Folio, this Fiend Folio. Same name, same concept, different edition of the game. Now there are a few familiar faces in this book, but this is a book that I have not revisited on this channel in quite some time. And this book is very important in today's episode because the Chrono Tyran was only ever put in a D&D book once ever. And it was here. Just looking at this thing, it's pretty easy to describe visually. Essentially, it's a giant crow with a set of humanoid arms coming from under its wings. And lacking anything in the image for scale, it might actually be kind of hard to tell, but it is a large creature. They stand about 12 feet tall and are always seen with their collection of shiny magic items. Their typical wardrobe includes a marvelous golden staff and a leather vest with tons of compartments and straps on it for carrying around magic things. If it wasn't obvious already, these guys love magic. You might even go as far as to say they are obsessed with it. In the same way that a crow might hoard little pieces of shiny trash they pick up off the ground, the Chrono Tyran has a vast collection of magical items, most of which they've made themselves. Because Chrono Tyrans are smart. Like, really smart. They have a near genius level intellect, which is only compounded by the fact that they have two brains. From the outside looking in, you would never be able to tell, but these creatures have two distinct brains in their head that are capable of performing individual thoughts and actions entirely independent of one another. Let me explain something to you. You see, you're not normal. <laughs> in other words, they can literally do two things at once. They can swing a sword while casting a spell. Or they can cast two spells at the same time. They can even concentrate on two different spells simultaneously. They might even watch D&D lore videos on their TV while playing Zelda Tears of the Kingdom on their Nintendo Switch without missing a thing on either device. It's okay. I get it. It's a great game. Now, not only can they multitask like someone with ADHD and suffer none of the negative consequences, they also have two voice boxes, so they can literally carry on two different conversations at once. It also means that when they're talking directly to a single individual, they speak with two distinct voices simultaneously, which is eerie as fuck. You can't tell me that a giant crow person who speaks in echoes isn't one of the most intriguing traits for a monster out there. Just from a purely aesthetic standpoint, this sets such a tone. Upon interacting with this monster, it should be obvious very quickly to anyone involved that this is a very weird and somewhat alien creature that they have never seen the likes of before. If I'm getting excited about this, I apologize, I just think thematically this creature has all the makings of an extremely memorable NPC. But that aside, the next thing I want to address is something I'm sure all the language majors in the room have already caught on to, and that is the Chrono Tyran's relationship with time. Specifically, with time magic. These creatures value all magic as a very powerful set of tools the way any good wizard or scholar would. But the proverbial diamond pickaxe in their tool collection is the use of time magic, or chronomancy. 
Not only do they employ chronomancy to suit their needs, they consider it to be the most desirable form of magic, period. These creatures are exceptionally arrogant about this as well, and will often declare themselves as masters of time, despite the fact that while their grasp on time magic is certainly very impressive, it's far from mastery. They're capable of casting spells like slow and time stop, but when matched up with other creatures like, I don't know, say the time elemental, it's still within the realm of what any dedicated wizard might be able to achieve with enough study and practice. But that doesn't stop them from talking so much smack. And to be fair, given the level of competency with magic that any commoner is liable to have in most D&D settings, maybe they've got somewhat of a point. Drop that stupid stick, you're not a wizard! The origin of the Chrono Tyrant is dubious at best. Let me just read you the entirety of their cultural story word for word from the book. Chrono Tyrants are believed to be native to Asheron, although the creatures have scattered across the planes of existence. Oh, were you hoping for more? Nope, that's, that's it. That's all we get. There's some other stuff in this book about Chrono Tyrants, but that is the only bit of text we get explaining where they come from and what their society is like. But at least there's a location. We can work with that. The Infernal Battlefield of Asheron is a lawful neutral plane that is essentially a d and d version of Valhalla from Norse mythology. Many gods of war, most notably the god of orcs, Groomsh, and the god of goblins, Maglubiet, reside there and wage war with one another endlessly. It's basically just a massive Halo 3 deathmatch lobby with no timer set and no victory conditions available. Where the Chrono Tyran fits in on this plane, I truly have no idea. If we were talking about some big, hulking, brutish, warlike monster, that makes perfect sense to me. But a creature like the Chrono Tyran, who is obsessed with knowledge and the study of magic, being from Asheron, is very strange, especially with literally no explanation given as to why. If I had to guess, I would say they may have started as servants of Wee Jess, who is a goddess of death that also presides on Asheron, but your guess is as good as mine. But regardless of what their true origin is, these creatures eventually spread their wings and left the nest to search for arcane secrets the world over. As I mentioned, they are obsessed with finding new magic and new arcane secrets and scraps of lore, and they're also very reluctant to share that information with anybody else. They're honestly just pretty secretive in general. They make their nests in hard to find places and usually use wards or illusion magic to keep outsiders as far away as possible. And for good reason. Because of this obsession with magic that they have, they tend to accumulate massive hordes of arcane items ranging from simple magic trinkets all the way up to extremely powerful artifacts. And if your D&D party is anything like mine, we all know how this goes down. <laughs> And speaking of which, assuming an adventuring party does roll up on the Chrono Tyran's lair, let's shift gears a bit here and talk about what kind of abilities it has at its disposal to both defend itself and go on the attack. Combat with a Chrono Tyran is something that you, as an adventurer, want to be very prepared for. Be prepared! Honestly, it's probably best if you just don't get mixed up in that at all, but if you are determined to fight this creature or you find yourself in a situation where you have no choice, you're gonna wanna have a plan. Clocking in with a challenge rating of 16, the Chrono Tyrant is no joke. They cast spells as if they were 12th level wizards, which means they have spell slots all the way up to level six. And trust me when I say, they love casting spells. Shadow Wizard Money Gang, we love casting spells. But even without their spells, they can still cause some serious damage. They've got your standard talent and bite attacks for dealing out physical damage and taking care of weaker foes. And since their feathers are made from adamantine, that's right, the magic birds have built in Kevlar, they can unleash a feather flurry attack at a range for massive damage, where they literally shoot out adamantine feathers and slash the target to bits. Using their dual voice boxes, they can also unleash a horrible sonic screech that causes a ton of thunder damage and potentially deafens anyone that hears it. But everything I've mentioned thus far is more standard D&D &D fare. We've seen monsters with some variation of these abilities before. 
What makes the Chrono Tyrant stand out as an exceptionally deadly enemy is an ability that so few monsters throughout D&D's history have ever had. And that is the fact that the Chrono Tyrant gets two actions every single turn. Because of those two distinct brains allowing them to do two things at once, mechanically, this translates to them literally being able to take two actions. So the Chrono Tyrant can attack twice on its turn, effectively doubling its damage output. Or if you really want to add some spice to the scene, make it cast two spells like I mentioned before. And depending on what spells you choose to have it cast, that can be devastatingly bad. Making this trait fit more with the 5th edition design philosophy, and also just making it work in such a way that it didn't just outright nuke entire groups of players with ease, was a very difficult task. It ended up being a bit harder than I thought it was going to be at first. So I ended up changing a few key things about how this all functions in my conversion of this monster. So in the interest of letting you guys know what on the stat block is my own interpretation and what is originally part of this creature, I want to get into the design process a little bit more than I usually do with these videos. For those of you not interested in game mechanics, feel free to skip to the next part. I apologize in advance, but this is going to get crunchy for a second. So the dual actions trait in 3rd edition used to effectively give this creature two turns every time its turn came up in the initiative order. If you want to get legal about it, it had two full round actions, I'm not going to get into what that means. Don't worry about it, if you know, you know, if you don't, it got two turns. I really dislike this, because there's nothing stopping a particularly clever Chrono Tyrant or an evil dungeon master from selecting spells to put on the creature's spell list that when cast together have just ridiculously powerful and unfun effects for everyone at the game table, even if they are very effective. When you're dealing with a creature like a Chrono Tyrant who is exceptionally intelligent, it feels really bad to not play them optimally, because of course if there was an exceptionally powerful combination of spells that would just blow away anybody who came across their path, they would do that. One spell combo that's honestly pretty far down the totem pole of overpowered spell combos is to cast something like Disintegrate to do a ton of damage, then Invisibility to just disappear and fly away. Then on your next turn, maybe throw out a Fireball and then cast Invisibility again to disappear and fly away. I know for a fact there are even more egregious combos out there, but instead of diving down that rabbit hole, I'm just going to leave that to the min-maxers in the comments section to let us know what the worst two spells you could cast in a single round would be. And we want this creature to be very tough, we want this to be a hard encounter, but we don't want it to be an annoying slog. So I feel like the simplest fix for this, in my opinion, is to still give it two turns, but have each one of those turns show up separately in the initiative order. The Chrono Tyrant in my conversion literally just rolls initiative twice and then takes two turns. It's very simple. And it is very possible that those two turns, depending on how the dice land, may end up back to back regardless but at least you're creating a circumstance where there's an opportunity for some player intervention between Chrono Tyrant actions. And honestly, just having it work on two different turns feels good to me. The other thing I changed about this monster isn't even really a mechanical thing. I mean, there is one little mechanic attached to it, but overall, not a massive change. As you guys know, we're now getting some original artwork created for the monsters that we cover on Monster of the Week. So when I spoke to this week's artist, Dakota Curry, about painting this monster for me, I asked him to give them two heads. On the surface, this might seem like a really minor change, but I think it has implications that are actually kind of far-reaching. By giving this monster two heads, it tells the players immediately from a visual standpoint that something is up with this monster. So when it starts to take two turns every round, it doesn't feel like such a gotcha. Plus, I just think it looks cool, and I really like the idea of the two heads interacting with the players simultaneously and kind of with each other. Because while this monster may have two heads in my idealized version of it, it is still one personality, so I like to picture the two heads kind of talking to each other the way that a person might talk to themselves while working through some kind of issue. This is literally the first time ever that my 5th edition conversion of a monster has included a redesign of what it looks like, so I definitely want to know what you guys think about this. Get in the comments! Ultimately, the only thing the redesign here caused me to add to the stat block is I borrowed the two headed trait that we have seen on a creature like the Etten in the past and put it on the Chrono Tyrant. 
But moving on from aesthetics, the other thing I did actually adjust about the stat block were its spells. The original creature could cast both Feeble Mind and Time Stop as innate spells, and it had all the other spells on its list function as if they were class spells. This meant that we had two separate spell lists, one for its learned spells from its class as it leveled up, and the other being innate spells that it just can cast because of what it is, and that felt extremely overcomplex to me. So I removed the innate spells entirely, which is why the creature is listed as CR 16 instead of the original CR 19 from 3rd edition. But obviously those spells are very thematic, and depending on the level of your party going up against this thing, you might want to include them. So my solution to this problem was I included optional rules for a magic item called the Staff of Corvus that any Chrono Tyran may have on them at any given time, which allows them to cast these spells once per day. So if you want that extra juice, it's all still there, it's just baked into a magic item which is now optional, instead of being actually built into the creature itself. I did try to do this in a way though, so that if you hate this, you can just have its dual action trait function the way it used to, and include those spells from the magic item back on the creature's innate spell list, and you're good to go. Obviously, I prefer my version more, I wouldn't have made it that way if that wasn't the case, but I also fully recognize that every DM and every table is different, and you are ultimately the expert in what your players will enjoy, so do whatever you feel is right. My goal, whenever I make any of these monster stat blocks, is always to give you as many different options as possible and different tools to use at the game table, so let me know in the comments what you think about all this. I apologize if that was a little bit crunchy for those of you watching who may not even play D&D and are just here for cool monster lore, but the game mechanics are all behind us now, I promise. So let's talk about that cool monster lore and how we might use that monster lore to tell a story. The Chrono Tyrant is a really diverse creature that can fill tons of different roles in a campaign. Like with most monsters, they can be one-off oddities encountered in a dungeon. In fact, when I first discovered this monster, it was during a D&D 3.5 campaign where the DM had the Chrono Tyrant appear as the final boss of a pretty expansive dungeon where they had hidden themselves away behind a prismatic wall to study cosmic secrets. Just that alone was pretty effective at the time and clearly left a lasting impact on me because I still remember it over a decade later. However, the Chrono Tavern can also make a great addition to a campaign in a more prominent role. I love the idea that there's a Chrono Tyrant nesting in a mountain range or ancient forest, and there are legends of this mysterious creature's whereabouts, but very few actual confirmed sightings. And maybe your players are seeking out the Chrono Tyrant because they need help with something. They might need information on a topic that has long since passed into myth. Or perhaps they need to get an extremely powerful curse lifted and they turn to this mythical creature hoping for a way to do that. Or maybe they just want some powerful magical object to give them a little bit of a boost before they go take on some major threat. Whatever the situation, they need something from the Chrono Tyran, and the Chrono Tyran likely isn't going to give it to them. After all, they collect and hoard all those magic items and arcane secrets zealously, and are notorious for not wanting to share them with anyone. The players will have to convince them. They could do this through force, by finding something of equal value that's less useful to them specifically to trade with the Chrono Tyran, or maybe even just by planning a heist if it's a physical object thereafter. But regardless of the outcome, an imperious two-headed crow person with mastery over magic and an obsession over time and the arcane is a way more interesting NPC to interact with than the hundredth wizard or lich they could also find in this role. If there's any liches watching, I'm sorry, that was, that was just a joke. I want to focus on their obsession with magic for a moment. A Chrono Tyran's lair could theoretically look like lots of different things, but Let's say hypothetically, in this situation, it looks like a library. You could literally just rip off that one episode of Avatar The Last Airbender wholesale using a Chrono Tyrant, and I think that would make for a great D&D adventure. You could say that about basically any episode of Avatar The Last Airbender. In fact, Zipper on Disney did a whole video about that exact topic. And for those of you who haven't seen the show, you should watch it, it's a great show, but what I'm talking about here is setting up the Chrono Tyrant as an ancient keeper of lore. 
The bird spirit librarian in the show is only willing to allow access to his library if you contribute something to his collection of knowledge. So following that idea, maybe the players have to tell our Chrono Tyron pal something they don't already know. This could be by providing an ancient tome with specific histories in it that are mostly lost, or maybe gifting them some kind of rare spell scroll, or any myriad of things the players might come up with to fulfill this requirement. It can be a fun little puzzle, and worst case scenario, if the players have truly nothing to offer, maybe the Chrono Tyrant can send them on some kind of quest to fetch an ancient tome that it knows the location of but is unable to access for some reason. This might just lead them into another dungeon, or maybe to a heist where they have to steal some kind of rare volume from a local noble. Or, you know, combat's also always on the table as well. I choose violence. For something even more Chrono Tyrant centric though, I could see an entire campaign being based around this library concept. The players would all be agents of the Chrono Tyrant and each week they would be sent out on some new adventure to track down an obscure piece of knowledge or magic item. Kind of imagine this as one part Indiana Jones, one part National Treasure, but their boss is a giant bird guy. I also feel like given the crow raven adjacent nature of the Chrono Tyrant, giving them some kind of connection to the Kenku could be really neat. Perhaps the leader of a Kenku kingdom is a Chrono Tyrant. Kind of like how the King Zora in Zelda is a lot bigger and seemingly more powerful. Maybe the king of the Kenku is 12 feet tall and has two heads. They might even be the only version of their species capable of original speech, which would further solidify their position as rightful ruler. Or maybe you take away their ability to talk and stick with that Kenku trait that forces them to mimic sounds in order to communicate with one another because I feel like having two voice boxes would allow you to create a whole soundscape in comparison to what a Kenku can normally do. The proverbial Dolby Atmos of Crow people. In continuing with our Corvus themed plot hooks, maybe a Chrono Tyrant in your world is acting as a mortal agent of the Raven Queen. I could totally see one of these guys being a sort of high priest to the Raven Queen that is basically the Pope of the Raven Queen's Shadowfell Church. What they're up to and what they want to achieve could be literally anything. The Raven Queen is fickle like that. But what a cool creature to replace that more conventional priest archetype. In fact, given their ties to the plane of Asheron, having them work on behalf of Wee Jass or really any other death god would be extremely fitting. I feel like this is one of those monsters I could just go on and on and on about. I'm having to rein myself in here, but just a couple more quick thoughts before we end the video today. Firstly, I think these guys would fit really well in Ravenloft as some kind of mystical third party who opposes Strahd or whatever other villain is ruling the domain of dread that they happen to be in. Not necessarily an ally, but an interested third party who can either be worked with or against depending on what their goals are and what the party wants to achieve. Or hell, maybe the Chrono Tyrant is the ruler of its own domain of dread completely separate from the rest of Barovia. I know this isn't going to be relevant to a lot of you watching right now, but a Chrono Tyrant present in a setting like Innistrad or just any kind of gothic horror situation is just a match made in heaven. Edgar Allan Poe eats your heart out. These guys are truly just one of my favorite monsters of all time, and I'm so glad we got to talk about them again on this channel many years after the fact. But I wouldn't be here talking about this monster today at all if it weren't for the support from all the folks over on Patreon, so thank you to all of my lovely patrons, and a huge shout out to this week's randomly selected Patron of the Week. Thank you so much to Darlax the Conqueror for your support. I really appreciate you salting the fields of my enemies, and your support is greatly appreciated. And thank you for watching. As always, there is a link in the description down below to a fifth edition conversion of this monster in the form of a Google document. And if you are one of my lovely patrons, you'll also find a link to the Patreon page down there, which will take you over to the Dungeon Dad Patreon page where you can find the Dungeon Dad style monster of the week, high res PDF stat block with the new artwork, fancy schmancy layout, and all the cool bells and whistles. But all that said, if there's a monster you would like to see show up in a future episode of Monster of the Week, let me know either in the comments down below or over in the Dungeon Dad Discord. We have a monster suggestions channel where you can suggest a monster. It will be added to our master list. And who knows? You might just see it show up in a future episode of Monster of the Week. I'd also be a terrible YouTuber if I didn't mention that we have merch now. As you can see, I am wearing some. I'm drinking water out of some. Look, real merch. It's a real mug. 
water just tastes so much better coming out of a Dungeon Dad branded mug. If you want to support me, support the show, aside from Patreon, one way that you guys can do that is by checking out the Dungeon Dad merch store. We've got shirts. This is a very simple Dungeon Dad embroidered logo shirt. We've also got the D&D's Nuts shirt for those of you who want to say your support loud and proud. And we've got mugs like this and all kinds of other neat stuff. So check that out. I'll probably, I mean, the link's always going to be in the thing, the description, the doobly-doo, as Matt Colville would say, down below. You can follow that link to the store there. It'll also probably be in the pinned comment. Either way... I'm very confident you'll be able to figure out where to find it if that's something you're interested in. So once again, thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned to the end to find out what's coming next week, and I'll see you then. Bye for now. Did you know that approximately 10% of a human body's weight is blood? That's an average of one and a half gallons. It would be pretty wild if someone figured out how to use all that biomass to summon a horrible creature. But nobody in Ravenloft would ever do something like that, right? Next episode, Blood Elemental. Tune in next time for lots more fan service.